we think it was a workshop. One of the survivors was the son of a mestizo that worked, they had a, what they call workshops in Santa Fe where they painted on hide. They didn't have canvas, and they were, but they were mostly ecclesiastics, uh, uh, religious paintings. And the Segesser painting, this is called Segesser II, uh, there was two paintings recovered at this time. Uh, Segesser II, um, by the bordering, and, and we, 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 we think it had to be done by a mestizo. It, you can't see it, but when this thing is full blown, all the Pawnees have, show their, their, their phallic parts, uh, and no Padre is going to be doing that. And, and I don't know, in, in war, there's, there's some, some type of juxtaposition of, of manhood, but all the Pawnees are totally, uh, uh, you know, uh, naked and stripped down. So we don't think it was religiously oriented or even done by a priest. That leaves a workshop basis. And this thing is so spectacular and so extended, uh, we really don't know uh, what, 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 why or, or how, or we, but we suspect it was done in a workshop perhaps by one artist or a number of artists. But we almost have to count on the fact that there was an eyewitness. There's just too much detail. Okay? So hit her. Oh, before we do this, this, the Spanish had anticipated an attack. This represents a line of baggage in a horseshoe toward the threat. Uh, we, any, any army will do that at any time. If, you're, if you have a threat, you're going to line your barricade up to in, in the direction of the threat. If you study this, I can, you can figure out the different types of saddles they were using, the silhouettes. There's a whole bunch of real interesting things in there. Here you can see the corner of the Spanish. These are escopetas. Here's the ardagas. They have felt hats on. Uh, if you had any doubt that the Pueblo Indians, or their auxiliaries were brave, they're out front of this line shooting their arrows out. Some of these boys have two quivers and two lances. They're, they're out there to fight. All right, um, this is Father Mingus. Now, he had uh, done baptisms and marriages in, in, the, in, the, in, in Santa Fe, in the Rio Grande area, for about 15 years before he went on this expedition. It is so accurate, even his stockings are what Franciscans wore. Uh, he has his robe up and back, Indians are filling in behind. We think this is Naranjo, who was a Pueblo Indian auxiliary, and they called him Captain Major of War. He was a bad boy. And he's leading the Padre, not out of the fray, but right into the boys to help him out. And here's a close-up of it. You notice he has two quivers, two lances. He's got somebody impaled, but they're filling in behind him as a nightmare. And he's uh, carrying uh, the cross, and he's going to be with the boys, and he will lose his life in the fight. This is a wider picture. Here again is the Padre uh, moving in. You can see the French have already infiltrated this is the most historical painting done by an observer, not only in New Mexico, but uh, in, in the United States. It represents an absolute national treasure. These are the people that will survive the fight. If you study it well, there's arrows stuck in the ground like this, so the horsemen had pulled back out of arrow shot, which is about 100 yards, so you can begin to understand the perspective of the painting but they cannot avoid being shot at, and, and you'll see a guy falling back being shot by bullets. Here are two Pueblo Indians that look like porcupines, they're so full of arrows. And they, they've made it out, but there's two Frenchmen right on them, boom, boom, and they're gonna kill them both. So these, these guys would have su survived over the last 200 year period, but they're, they're not gonna survive. And this is where the horse and the gun gradient starts flipping over the whole concept of Indian warfare on the Great Plains. This is a corporal. You see he's wearing a Striva de Cruz. He has a weapon that is a uh, corporal's lance. This is a multi-purpose weapon. If they don't get you on one, they'll get you on the other. Uh, and uh, they call it the main event. <laughs> And you'll notice he is, you can't see it, but you, you'll see in some pictures up here, you'll, he is using this weapon. Uh, he has a Estriba de Cruces. He's knocking down a Frenchman with his horse and his Estribos. He's being backed up by a Pueblo Indian. The Indian has two arrows still in his hand using the bow. Earliest pictures of bow and arrows, earliest pictures of horse equipment, earliest pictures of tents. This painting is incredible. These 
people lost their lives, but they did rescue one man. And he was wounded nine times, and he, uh, and he happened to survive the fight. So those guys pulled one man out of trouble and lost their lives doing it. So uh, it was a pretty interesting day. Okay, let's see what else we have here. You can see how thick the fighting was. The man has been shot through the arm, through the back, through the side. Uh, he's being cold cocked. Here's a soldier that was not well dressed when he came out. He still has his bed clothes on. You can see his, <laughs> his stockings. Uh, it is a hell of a way to wake up. We think this symbolized the man with nine mortal wounds that was rescued that day, and he went on to have a good life. This is an Apache tent, 1720. See this weapon up here? It looks like a, it's a very strange thing. I'm going to bring, bring a piece over here. Thank you for bearing with me. Where is the painting today? By the blessing of the good Lord, I was, uh, I was pivotal in finding the, the million dollars at the last minute. And, and uh, through a great effort of everybody else, we, they now reside in it, uh, the palace of the governors where they really? belong. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I'll tell you how, how that happened. Okay, I was trying to figure out, they, they, they did the excavation where these Pawnees were hanging out, and they never found a weapon like this thing. And then uh, I was over in France, and this is a garden hoe. And I thought, well, what would happen if you just bent the damn thing over? Yeah, and, and, and I think, this is what they're doing. They took an agricultural hoe, hoe and, the, and the French put them on a blacksmith and bent them over, and that it would be extremely lethal uh, with, the longer, with longer times, of course, and I think that's what that is, if I had to guess, because there's no other artifact of that nature in any museum that I can find. And that's part of the excitement uh, of uh, this painting. Notice the length of the French gun. That is what they call a Thule musket which is about three times the size of a Spanish escapeta, and they complained that they shot further and more accurately. That was one of the complaints as a result of this battle being lost. Here are the two Indians I was telling you that were peppered with arrows. The brown spot represents smoke at where they're being shot, so these guys normally would have been a survivor, but the two French aren't letting them escape, so down they went. As a result of, the, of this fight, a third of the fighting forces for, for Spain out of New Mexico were killed. And it would stop all further progress. They would, they would go no further in their expansion. They, they would be shut down and have to form themselves into a defensive position. As a result of this fight, the Comanche on horse now was able to get the French gun and fully armed, started after the Apaches. They start in northern Colorado, and they just keep coming, and they go right down through San Antonio and drive those Lipans right deep into Mexico and into Enchilada territory. Uh, they never stop. And that whole 18th century would be the genocide of the Apaches by the, by the Comanches. Now, the reason the Apaches couldn't hold their own, they're plenty tough, but the Spanish Empire's policy was never to give their allies guns. And therefore, the Apaches, found themselves in a trap. They're being pressed by the time San Saba comes up. Let's, let's go to the, okay, and this, excuse me, this is just the return. So the artist shows the beginning of the fight and the end of the fight after all the killing's been done. And a lot of the ecclesiastic paintings have these animals and borders around. That's why we think it was probably done in a church workshop where these guys have the ochres and the paints and so forth and so on. This is the gentleman his name was Father Segeser. He had very wealthy uh, parents in Switzerland. And Father Segeser uh, was the second citizen of Arizona. At that time, it was called Pimaria Alta, Upper Pima Country. He was right behind Father Kino. And he was in the Tucson area. And we think the paintings, paintings lingered around. There's, we have two paintings, Segeser I and Segeser II. Uh, but, but Segeser II, this painting, um, we think they eventually ended up in the hands of De Anza, who was famous for killing the Comanche chief Cuerno Verde. And then we think they were eventually went down to, to uh, Father Segeser, who, by the way, brought the first marijuana to Mexico. He brought two 55-gallon drums of hemp seeds. In each barrel, there's a pair of pistols. There, there you have it. There's the inside story. Original cartel. <laughs> yeah, there, and, 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 and he says, I went through a great deal of trouble in this matter, although there's no particular important things in it, talking about a box. I would not want that box be dispatched differently <laughs> from the way I packed it, since I did so with the greatest of care. In another letter, he said in 1761, 
I have in the meantime sent a box in which my heart has been shipped. It has been delayed in Mexico for more than a year. All that is in the box is not worth four pennies, except the three colored skins, which can be considered curios and of little value. God grant it arrived. He is in real bind because if he put insurance on it, we all face this every day. Uh, uh, we got to pay for the insurance, but you're going to draw inspectors. And so he tried to play it down, which he did. And all three skins arrived. However, one disappeared. And, and, and we can't find it, and it's still part of the treasure hunt today. Already? Let's flash forward. George Washington is now 36 years of age. And the Apaches have been pounding the heck out of San Antonio for a couple of years. And by 1757, they started laying off. And they started trying to make friends with the Spanish in San Antonio, making treaties and so forth. And then they asked for a mission north of San Antonio and a little bit west on the, near present-day Menard and to build a mission in their behalf, and they'd be happy to come. And after a huge uh, uh, bunch of political upgoings, there was a gentleman by the name of Romero de uh, Terreros who made his money in the mining business. And he had a cousin that was uh, a, a padre. Uh, his name was Alfonso uh, uh, Tijeras. And, and um, Alfonso Giraldo. Tijeras. And you got to roll your R's. It's T-E-R-E-R-R-O-S. And my tongue's like a damn piece of wood. Excuse me. Uh, 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 and he talked the state. He said he would back the mission because there was rumors of silver mines at San Saba. He backed the mission for three years and then reassessed the situation. And only if his cousin was put in, in head custodianship of the mission. And that's basically what happened. So by 1757, they had established a mission and a presidio. Let me back up a little bit. The whole way the Spanish expanded from the time they landed in the Valley of Mexico, they would consider the Indian as an asset, not a liability. And therefore, he became or she became an equal vassal under the king. Not, not status-wise, but if you're a good-looking coyotero, which would be a mixture between a Spanish and an Indian and an Indian and a black, uh, if, uh, you could rise to power just like anybody can do today through the social structure. But in general, the, the Indian was considered as a vassal to the Spanish Empire as early as 1501. They developed the Council of Indies to protect Indians in the New World. Queen Isabella would have nothing to do it when, 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 uh, when uh, Columbus came back with Indians for potential slaves. He said, no, they're, 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 they have the souls like us, but they're, you know, they just need a little time. The idea was that there wasn't enough people, so the, the missionaries would go into the wild country and bring the wild ones out of the hills and bring them down into what they call a pueblo, which is a design for a Roman city in which everything circulates around the plaza. You'd have your church and your, your business and so forth, and you had concentric rings. And they, with time, they teach them religion, but they teach them horticulture, agriculture, blacksmithing, preparing them for the coming change. And I'm not going to say it was kumbaya. A man sneezed and a thousand Indians would die. But we're still killing Indians uh, is the, uh, uh, from Jamestown in, uh, at Wounded Knee in 1895. Uh, and, 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 and so... Um, then those Indians would become tax-paying citizens. It didn't always work that well, so they bring a presidio in to enforce the bringing back of the neophytes that split after they were brought in to, for the rehabilitation, or whatever you want to call it. And so they had hopscotch from Mexico City all the way up into uh, the northernmost reaches of Texas and New Mexico and eventually California. So when the mission was built at San Saba, the only restriction was that they moved the Presidio three miles away so that the Spanish boys wouldn't get after the young neophyte girls. Basically, that was it. Uh, the following year, the Apaches came, I think, 2,000 of them. And everyone was happy as heck to, that the church was going to work out. They walked right by. They were heading north to encounter the Comanche. And in the process, all the little gifts that were given by the church and other Spanish were dropped in their wake. The following year, the Apaches were coming back in twos, twos and threes, having been sorely tromped. 
by, by the Comanche and, and related tribes. Uh, and and uh, so they started to doubt if it was going to work at San Saba, but it was too late. All of a sudden they started seeing smoke signals, uh, uh, horses were being stolen. Uh, the commander uh, Ortiz or P Perea, Commander Perea at the Presidio said, uh, Father Tijeras, I, uh, Tijeras, I uh, recommend you and your, your people come on out. And uh, we, we got trouble afoot and eventually 2,000 Comanches show up at the gates of San Saba. <laughs> Long story short, they, they breach the gate, they, they slaughter not too many people, about seven out of 30 because the others shifted pretty quickly, but they, they, they killed Father Tijeros, the cousin of Pedro Tijeros, and uh, they killed another padre. His name was Father Santistiban, or Saint Sebastian, who it's appropriate because he was filled full of arrows. Oh, Father Sebastian, or Santistiban, never left the altar, while the two priests, uh, Molino and, and Father Tijeros, uh, were uh, confronting the Indians and trying to settle things down. He stayed at the altar praying. And uh, when, they, when they finally rushed the church, uh, they found him kneeling. Uh, they dispatched him, uh, burned the church, and they found his head uh, two or three days later over in the warehouse. This is the general jumping around a little bit. This is uh, Menard, and this is the basic map of where things came down and who and what and where and when. The Comanches were so thorough, they killed everything in the mission down to the house cats. And, and uh, one gentleman who got shot in the thigh earlier was a pretty brave man. He was protecting some 30 men uh, in which, who snuck out during the bonfire when they were burning the place down. He remained behind. The Comanches caught him, put out his eyes, and skinned him alive <laughs> and, uh, for his troubles. Um, yeah, just your average day on the plains. <laughs> you know? uh, okay, let's, let's, let's go to the... Okay, this is a close-up of Father Santisteban. You can see his uh, bullet holes, and uh, here is a picture in, in the painting uh, uh, that where he's down on the ground, they're cutting his throat right there, but that's not accurate. They don't think it's accurate. But the San Saba painting was commissioned by the wealthy mining merchant, Pedro Tijeras, and it remained in Mexico for 250 years. Uh, it was your Segaser painting. That belonged here. And it uh, had uh, been, the family sold it, or somebody sold it, and it arrived up here, and it was, became a political football for a while, and then the FBI, I think, confiscated the thing because uh, Mexico, that hadn't claimed it as a national treasure, now claimed it as a national treasure, and there wasn't paperwork on it. And I don't know what eventually happened to it. It, was, it showed up, it was in Austin, I think, for a year, and, and, uh, but uh, a judge finally made the decision, and your painting went back to Mexico. And, and uh, it's, it's a shame because of the history. Uh, like New Mexico in the, in, in the 